Chapter Twenty Eight of the Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Twenty Eight. Whom will he marry? Had Lillian Rosenberg been able to see the effect of her conversation upon Shiel after she had left him, she would have been disappointed. He had, prior to his interview with Lillian Rosenberg, as he told her, made up his mind to abandon all idea of marrying Gladys Martin, and there is a possibility that had her name not been mentioned, had she not been recalled so vividly to his mind, he would have adhered to that resolution, at all events so long as he refrained from seeing her. But such is human nature, or at least man's nature, that directly Lillian Rosenberg had left him, Shiel's love for Gladys burst out with such wild, invigorated force that it swept reason and everything else before it. Gladys! He could think of nothing else. Every detail in her appearance, every word she had spoken, came back to him with exaggerated intensity. Her beauty was sublime. There was no one like her, no one that could inspire him with such a sense of ideality no one that could lead him on to such dizzy heights of greatness it was all nonsense to say as lillian rosenberg had said there were just as many good fish in the sea as had ever come out of it there was only one gladys hamar should never marry her he would marry her himself she must be told at once of hamar's infamous designs a mad desire to see her came over him and disregardful of the doctor's orders that he should remain in bed several more days he got up and dressing as fast as his weak condition would allow him took a taxi and drove to waterloo on reaching the cottage at kew he found gladys at home and to his great joy alone there is nothing that appeals to a woman more than a sick man and shiel in coming to gladys in his present condition had unwittingly played a trump card had he appeared well and strong, she would probably have received him none too cordially, for she was very tired of men just then. But the moment her eyes alighted on his thin cheeks, and she saw the dark rings under his eyes, pity conquered. This man, at least, was not to blame. He was not of the same pattern as other men. He was not like so many men whose adulations had grown fulsome to her, and he was totally unlike Hamar in very sympathetic tones she inquired how he was and on learning that he had been sufficiently ill to be kept in bed asked why he had not told her auntie and i would have called to see you she said and brought you jelly and other nice things who waited on you had you no nurse fearful lest he should give her the impression he was speaking for effect or trying to trade on her feelings shiel was one of those people who are painfully exact he told her as simply as he could just how he had been placed but why come here gladys demanded when you were told to stay in bed till the end of the week it is frightfully risky shiel then explained to her the purport of his visit then it was to warn me to put me on my guard against hamar that you disobeyed the doctor's orders she said shiel nodded you are not displeased are you he asked nervously i am displeased with you for thinking so little of yourself gladys said and more than obliged to you for thinking so much of me you know i only consented to marry mr hamar to save my father and you say he no longer has the power to work spells i believe that to be a fact shiel replied then he lied to me gladys observed he threatened that unless i saw him as often as he wished and went with him wherever he wanted and a good many more things he would inflict my father with every conceivable disease you are quite sure your information is correct absolutely then thank god gladys said with a great sigh of relief i shall know how to act now you will break off your engagement shiel inquired eagerly no i can't do that gladys said sadly i promised to marry mr hamar and therefore marry him i must promises made under such conditions are extortions they don't count i fear they do gladys replied i've never yet broken my word then there's no hope for me shiel gasped i must go it maddens me to see you the affianced bride of that devil 
he rose to go but had hardly gained his feet when his strength utterly failed and he collapsed gladys helped him into a chair and then flew for some brandy in the hall she met her aunt who had just returned from an afternoon call in a few words she explained what had happened poor young man miss templeton said i thought he looked very ill the last time i saw him and he came here solely to benefit you well you have a good deal to answer for and your face is not only your own misfortune but other people's too but it will never do for your father to see mr davenport he went off in a very bad temper this morning and if he comes back and finds him here there'll be a scene miss templeton and gladys consulted together for some minutes and then decided to send for a taxi and have shiel conveyed back to his rooms miss templeton accompanying him miss templeton knew that shiel was poor but like most people who have lived in comfortable surroundings all their lives she had no idea of what poverty was like the poverty of a seven and sixpenny week room in a back street and when she saw it she nearly swooned why this is a slum she ejaculated as the taxi stopped next door to a fried fish shop in a narrow street swarming with children sucking bread and jam and rolling each other over in the gutters i don't wonder the man is ill here she said to herself as the door of the house they stopped at opened and she snuffed the atmosphere the place reeks and oh gracious is this the landlady yet the woman was ordinary enough the type of landlady one sees in all back streets greasy face straggling hair dirty blouse black hands bitten fingernails short skirts prodigious feet a grubby child clinging on to her dress and every indication of the speedy arrival of another i suppose you're his mother hain't you mum she said gaping at miss templeton's rather fashionable clothes in open-mouthed wonder i told him he ought not to go out but he never eats what i says miss templeton though not particularly flattered at being taken for shiel's mother since like most ladies of mature age she wished to be regarded as much younger nevertheless thought it better not to disillusion the woman the poor she told herself often have very decided views on propriety with the woman's aid she got shiel upstairs and as he was too feeble to undress himself despite his protestations helped to disrobe him she had thought when she first saw the slum of returning to kew at once but she did no such thing she stayed with shiel persuaded the landlady to make him some gruel which proved to be a sorry mess but had at least the advantage of being hot and bribed one of the children to fetch the doctor shiel nearly died had it not been for the careful nursing and good food provided by miss templeton who visited him every day he would never have turned the corner the poor dear is terribly fond of you miss templeton said to gladys in his delirium he talked of nothing but saving you from leon hamar from that devil leon hamar and if one can place any reliance at all on the cravings of a sick man a devil leon hamar undoubtedly is what a pity it is shiel hasn't money these remarks were naturally not without effect on gladys and she could not help growing more and more interested in the man whose love for her had proved so deep-rooted and ideal that he practically sacrificed his life in an attempt to save her finally she found herself awaiting her aunt's daily report of his illness with an anxiety that was almost acute in the meantime john martin came home one evening in a rare state of excitement what do you think he exclaimed throwing a bundle of letters on the table one of dick's speculations has turned out trumps after all he had invested several thousands of pounds in shiel's name in enamel ivorine the new stuff for stopping teeth which looks exactly like part of the teeth i remember i thought it an absurd adventure at the time but for once in a way i was wrong mm -hmm, interrupted gladys there has been a sudden boom in the patent every dentist is using it and as a consequence the shares have risen enormously i've heard from dick's lawyer to-day that shiel is now worth fifty thousand pounds good heavens miss templeton ejaculated and gladys has bound herself to hamar i suppose she said afterwards when john martin and she were together alone that you would not have any objection to shiel now if gladys were free to marry him certainly not john martin said 
certainly not i always liked shiel a fine manly young fellow very different to the type one usually meets nowadays i only wish gladys were free you would raise no obstacle to her becoming engaged to shiel none whatsoever but what's the good of talking about an impossibility gladys is stubbornness herself and once she has made up her mind to do a thing nothing in god's world will make her not do it wait miss templeton said wait and see i think i can see a possible way out of it she had learned much from shiel in his wanderings he had constantly alluded to hamar curtis kelson and lillian rosenberg to the great compact and to the one possible way of breaking that compact namely through the instigation of a quarrel between the trio from several of the statements he had made miss templeton deduced that kelson was greatly under the influence of lillian rosenberg and it was from these statements that she finally received an inspiration miss templeton saw deeper than shiel it had always been her custom to read between the lines no she argued if kelson were so easily influenced by lillian rosenberg who is young and attractive it was almost a sine qua non that he was in love with her and as marriage was one of the eventualities strictly forbidden to the trio in the compact they must neither quarrel nor marry shiel had exclaimed here was their chance kelson must marry lillian rosenberg and by so doing break the compact and overwhelm the trio in some sudden and dire catastrophe but the marriage must take place within six months time how could that be arranged could lillian rosenberg be bribed or persuaded into it for of course miss templeton being a woman albeit an old maid had at once divined that lillian rosenberg was in love with shiel that she did not care a straw for kelson and that to marry the latter she would need some very strong inducement and the only inducement she could think of was lillian's genuine love for shiel yes it is upon this one weakness of lillian's that i must work she said to herself it is the only way i can see of saving gladys resolved at any rate to experiment upon these lines she lost no time in seeking out lillian rosenberg who received her very coldly and was distinctly rude what have my affairs to do with you who sent you here she demanded humanity miss templeton replied i have come entirely of my own accord to plead the cause of one who is seriously ill possibly dying seriously ill possibly dying lillian rosenberg said incredulously nevertheless turning pale mr davenport is surely not as bad as all that when did you see him last miss templeton asked a fortnight ago lillian rosenberg replied i have been inundated with work these past two weeks then you've not heard that he's had a relapse miss templeton said and is now in a most critical condition he has something on his mind and the doctor assures me that whilst he is still worrying over that something there is no chance of recovery do you know what it is the something lillian rosenberg asked the white on her cheeks intensifying yes miss templeton said slowly and trying to appear calm he is very worried about miss martin's engagement to mr hamar and why pray because he knows all about mr hamar and the compact he has told you i have gleaned it from what he has said in his delirium has he been as ill as that yes he has he had a temperature of a hundred and four the day before yesterday for a few moments there was silence then lillian rosenberg said can you believe what a man says in delirium in this instance i feel sure you can miss templeton replied why should miss martin's engagement be of such interest to mr davenport miss templeton thought for a moment because she said at last he is in love with her are you sure of it absolutely do you think she cares for him even as much as that and she snapped her fingers i think she may care for him a very great deal some day she has begun to care for him already but she never would dream of marrying one as badly off as mr davenport he is practically starving he was but he's not now he's come into money and she explained about the fifty thousand pounds 
i see lilian rosenberg said after a prolonged pause that accounts for her having just begun to care for him supposing there was someone who had been fond of him all along in the days when he hadn't a halfpenny to his name and everyone else shunned him i should feel very sorry for that person miss templeton said but setting aside the sacrifice of his happiness it would be wrong for him to marry her if his heart was fixed elsewhere which you say it is which i am sure it is well supposing it is what does it concern me why tell me all this because it lies in your power to put an end to the compact and bring about the catastrophe the unknown threatened i think you credit me with rather too much i do not quite see how i can accomplish all this but i do miss templeton said briskly i believe i am right in saying mr kelson is in love with you that you can make him do pretty well anything you please well all you have to do is lead him on to propose and insist on his marrying you at once or at all events before the expiration of the compact if you succeed in doing this the compact will be broken that may be lilian rosenberg exclaimed but where pray should i come in why on earth should i marry a man i don't care a snap for why miss templeton replied slowly why because marrying a man you don't care a snap for you would save the life of a man i am quite sure you care a very great deal for end of chapter twenty eight read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter twenty nine of the sorcery club by elliot o'donnell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Twenty Nine: The End and the Beyond. It took Lillian Rosenberg some time to make up her mind. It's extraordinary, she said to herself, how fond I am of Shiel. I used to think it an impossibility for me to be really fond of anyone. The question is, however am i sufficiently in love with him to give him up to that soft little cat gladys martin if it weren't for this illness if i could only persuade myself that he wasn't as ill as miss whatever her name is said i shouldn't think twice i should let things be but as i feel surely he is really ill dangerously ill and the only chance of his recovery lies in the possibility of his marrying martin i must deliberate shall i or shall i not if it were any other woman i shouldn't so much mind but gladys martin i can't endure her there is one hope however namely that if he marries her he will soon tire of her and and come to me what a tremendous score off her that would be but no i wouldn't do that because because well there just like my infernal luck i love him could i marry him i wonder even if there were no gladys martin it is doubtful yet i believe i could but what is the good of conceiving impossibilities there is a gladys martin and i can never have shield the only question i have to settle is shall she have him shall i marry kelson so that martin can marry shield lilian rosenberg turned this question over in her mind for a whole day and night sometimes arriving at one decision sometimes at another in the end very elaborately dressed and looking daintier than she had ever done in her life she waylaid kelson and asked him to have tea with her any pretty face accentuated by all the allurements of a large mushroom hat and hobble skirt was enough for kelson but when that face belonged to the one girl for whom above all other girls he had a colossal weakness he simply could not feast his eyes enough on it have tea with you of course i will he said but we must be careful hamar is about if you walk on up the haymarket i'll follow in a taxi and pick you up directly i get to a safe distance i see you are as much in awe of mr hamar as ever lilian rosenberg laughed i'm not i've found him out he's all talk but do as you will get your taxi and i'll walk on we'll have tea in my new flat kelson was so delighted he hardly knew if he stood on his head or his heels 
"'You are prettier than ever,' he said as the taxi door shut and they sped away. "'I declare there seems to be no limit to your beauty.' "'Only because you're partial,' she said. "'I shall grow ugly one day, perhaps soon.' With a savage energy she set to work to completely overcome him. With a languishing expression in her eyes, eyes which she made use of mercilessly without giving him a moment's respite, he watched his whole being vibrate with love and adoration. They had hardly entered the drawing-room of her flat when he threw himself at her feet, and poured forth his worship of her in the most extravagant phrases. "'Look here, Mr. Kelson,' she said at length, withdrawing the hand it seemed as if he would never leave off kissing. "'This is all very well, but I dare say you make love to countless other girls in the same fashion. How can I tell if you are really serious?' "'Don't I look as if I am?' he cried. "'One can never judge correctly by looks,' she replied. "'They are terribly deceptive. "'You are very emphatic in your avowals of love, "'but you say nothing about marriage.' "'Then you do care for me. "'Jerusalem! "'How happy I should be if only I thought that!' "'Think it, then,' Lillian Rosenberg said, "'and let us come to an understanding. "'Can you afford to keep a wife?' keep her as i should expect to be kept plenty of new dresses jewellery theatres balls motors ascot henley cows i reckon i could do all that kelson replied i've just over a hundred and fifty thousand pounds in the bank and with this cure business i'm taking on an average ten thousand per week i would settle a hundred thousand on you and make you a handsome allowance a thousand a week more if you wanted it well lilian rosenberg said after a slight pause during which kelson had again seized her hand and was kissing it convulsively to quote one of your americanisms i reckon i'll fix up with you on one condition however and that kelson murmured still kissing her feverishly that we marry a week to-day kelson dropped her hand as if he had been shot we can't he replied the compact oh damn the compact lilian rosenberg said coolly you marry me then or not at all you are joking you know what the compact means i know what you think it means for my own part i don't see that you have the slightest reason to fear the unknown cannot really harm you all you have to do is to turn religious anyhow you must risk it that is to say if you want me it will lead to a quarrel with hamar kelson said desperately the firm will dissolve and i shan't get a cent more money i'll be content with what you have in the bank now we can live on the interest of fifty thousand the hundred thousand you will of course settle on me at once he was silent she taunted him she ridiculed him she at last lost her temper with him whereupon he succumbed the marriage should take place at a registry office within the week there'll be no time for a trousseau he said oh hang the trousseau she said i shall have the hundred thousand pounds and now for a word of advice be sure that you do not let hamar get any inkling of our approaching marriage and be most careful to avoid doing anything that might arouse his suspicions it isn't that i'm afraid of him but i don't want rows i'm sick to death of them you can rely on me to be careful darling kelson said kissing her on the lips i'll be discretion itself and so he meant to be all the same as is the case with every lover every lover worthy of the name lover who loves with all the full ripe vigour of genuine passion his heart played havoc with his head and he was blind to everything save visions of his beloved in other circumstances this would not have mattered very much but with hamar's lynx eyes continually watching him it was certain to lead to disaster ed hamar said to curtis one day matt's been getting into mischief i know the symptoms well he can't look me in the face and every now and then when he fancies my attention is attracted elsewhere i catch him peeping furtively at me as if he were frightened out of his life i should ferret out some secret it would be deplorable if now that we have got so near the end of the compact we should be held up by some idiotic blunder some nonsensical love affair of his i wonder whether it's rosenberg or some other girl will you find out how can i curtis growled i'm not his keeper i know that hamar said come be reasonable 
You want to be a Croesus, so that you can eat and drink your head off, don't you? Well, you will. You will be one of the three wealthiest men in the world. You will have the world at your feet, if only you stick to me for the next seven months, till we have passed the seventh stage. If you don't, if either you or Matt deliberately quarrel with me or marry, then, as I've dinned into your ears a thousand times, the compact will be broken, and, not only that, but some frightful catastrophe will wipe us off. Now will you do what I ask? Come, a dinner with me, every night this week at the Piccadilly, champagne and no vegetables. All right, Curtis said sulkily. For the good of the cause, I suppose I must, but I hate spying. Two nights later, in a private room at the Piccadilly, after dinner, when the champagne and liqueurs had got into Curtis's head, and he was leaning back in his chair, smiling and silly, Hamar suddenly said, "'Ed, you remember what I told you about watching Kelson? Have you discovered anything?' "'Supposing I have,' Curtis replied. "'Supposing I haven't. Watch then.' ah but i know you have hamar said striving to hide his eagerness come tell me another liqueur i'll square it with the unknown it won't hurt you won't it curtis gurgled won't it i'll tell you everything no nothing i mean but hamar when once he had smelt a rat was not easily put off he coaxed and coaxed and eventually succeeded Leonge curtis said with a sudden burst of drunken confidence leonge it's worse than either you or i suspected i caught them alone this morning in my office them rosenberg and matt yes of course shilly i told matt i was going out he thought i had so into the room i come quite unsuspected unobserved she was sitting on his knees cuddling and he was putting a ring on her finger four days more darling says he and we are married jerusalem damn the compact and damn hamar hamar doesn't suspect does he rosenberg says not a bit not in the slightest old matt replies why it is i who am brave now then he kisses her and fearing they would detect my presence i slips quietly out will you swear this is true leon said his voice trembling with excitement i'll swear it curtis answered but you look cross what's the matter leon god what's the matter an hour later as kelson was rising from his chair in front of the fire to gaze for the hundredth time that evening into the eyes of lilian rosenberg's portrait on the mantel-shelf the door of his room flew open and in staggered curtis white wet and bloated great heavens kelson cried what the deuce have you been doing to yourself you look a perfect devil i am one curtis groaned i am one matt i've given your show away my show away why what the deuce do you mean in a string of broken sentences curtis explained what had happened i'm damn sorry matt old man he pleaded it was the drink that did it i didn't know what i was saying till it was too late till i saw leon's face and that cleared my brain brought me to myself it was hellish i remember the moment i mentioned the word marriage he sprang up from his chair and as he hurried out i heard him mutter i'll go straight to her i'll matt old man he meant mischief i'm certain of it come with me to her flat for god's sake come and catching hold of kelson who leaned against the mantel-shelf dazed and stupefied he dragged him into the street to revert to hamar curtis's information had transformed him he was now another creature prior to his conversation with curtis he had suspected at the most that kelson might be contemplating a secret engagement to lilian rosenberg but a hasty marriage a marriage in a few days time he had never dreamt that kelson could be as mad as that it was outrageous it was abominable it was sheer wholesale homicide at all costs the marriage must be stopped and mad with rage hamar dashed out of the hotel and calling a taxi drove direct to lilian rosenberg's flat 
he found her alone alone and with a strange expression in her eyes an expression he had never noticed in them before she was in the act of examining a magnificent diamond ring you're quite out of breath she said coolly didn't you come up by the lift i've come to talk business hamar panted it's no use looking like that i know your secret my secret lilian rosenberg replied opening her eyes and simulating the greatest unconcern what secret i don't understand oh yes you do hamar said you understand only too well you deceitful minx had i only been smart i should have given you the sack months ago this marriage of yours with kelson shall not come off my marriage with mr kelson lilian rosenberg said turning a trifle pale i really don't know what you're talking about you do hamar shouted his fury rising you do you know all about it you were seen sitting on his knee this morning and all your conversation was overheard i have found out everything and i tell you you shan't marry him i shan't marry him lilian rosenberg said with provoking coolness whoever thinks i want to marry him he does i do hamar shouted his voice rising to a scream you've hoodwinked me long enough you hoodwink me no longer you've encouraged him from the first made eyes at him every time you've seen him taken advantage of my absence to prowl about the passages to waylay him had him round to your rooms and visited in his you've no sense of shame or honour you've broken your promises to me you're a liar anything else mr hamar lilian rosenberg said her eyes glittering when you've quite finished perhaps you'll kindly go and leave me in peace go leave you in peace hamar shouted damn you curse your impertinence go i'll not budge an inch till i wring from you an oath a solemn binding oath that you'll break off your engagement to kelson at once really mr hamar lilian rosenberg said i cannot put up with quite so much noise will you go or shall i ring for the porter to turn you out she moved in the direction of the bell as she spoke but before she could touch it hamar had intercepted her stop this foolery he said catching hold of her wrist i'm in grim earnest the lives of all three of us are at stake jeopardized through you through your infernal greed and selfishness do you hear please let go my wrist she said quietly i won't he shouted i'll squeeze crush it break it break you too unless you swear to break off your marriage i'll swear nothing lilian rosenberg said faintly you're a brute let me go or i'll cry for help she screamed but before she could repeat the scream hamar had her by the throat and then blind with passion and before he fully realized what he was about he had shaken her to and fro like a terrier shakes a rat and dashed her on the floor for some minutes he stood rocking with passion and then his eyes falling on the inanimate form at his feet he gave a great gasping cry and bent over it god in heaven he ejaculated she's dead i've killed her he was still bending over her still feeling her lifeless pulse still trying to resuscitate her feebly wondering how he had killed her feverishly debating the best course to pursue when curtis and kelson burst in on him at the sight of lillian rosenberg's lifeless body both men started back great god hamar curtis gasped what have you done to her nothing hamar said turning a ghastly face to them i-i found her like this liar kelson shouted beside himself with fury liar we heard her scream look at your hands there's blood on them you've killed her before curtis could stop him he sprang at hamar and the next moment both men were rolling on the floor call for the police ed kelson gasped the police or but before he could utter another syllable walls floor and ceiling shook with loud devilish laughter there was then silence enthralling impressive omnipotent silence the electric light went out and the room filled with luminous striped figures end of chapter twenty nine end of the sorcery club by elliot o'donnell read by don w jenkins rancho san diego California.